Welcome everyone um, to the latest lecture series hosted by the Evans Foundation. My name is Mehreen Khan. I am one of the EU correspondents for the Financial Times here in Brussels. Uh, first of all, it looks like we've got a pretty packed house. Thank you all for being here. I know times are a little bit tough. This might end up being the last hurrah for the year, but um, God willing, hopefully we'll see you again in the Beaux-Arts soon. Um, as I said, we are being hosted by the Evans Foundation, also by the Beaux-Arts, who um, uh, is our venue for tonight. Um, the title of today's talk uh, from Anne Petsfort is called We Need an Alternative to Globalization, a search for a new internationalism for the many, not the few. Uh, it will be my privilege to, in a few minutes, uh, Anne will take the floor. And for those who are not familiar with Anne's work, Anne is a political economist, a public intellectual, and an author who has spent many years, or for as long as I've been an economics journalist, has been at the forefront of developing new ideas about how economic policy should interact with our democracies, should interact with financial markets. And I think it's safe to say that she's among one of the most thought-provoking uh, and polemical thinkers at the forefront of debates around economic theory, at least in the English-speaking world. Um, Anne most recently wrote a book called The Case for the New Green Deal, which was published in 2009. The Green, a Green New Deal, sorry, this is the Brussels vernacular. I keep getting caught in European Commission speak about the Green Deal. Uh, the Green New Deal, published in 2019. Her previous works also include a book called The Production of Money. Uh, and before that, I think we can say she produced a very prescient work in 2006 called The Coming of the First World Debt Crisis which foresaw some of the more toxic debt deflationary dynamics, which then played out only a few years later in the seismic financial crisis, which you know, at least I grew up in as an economics journalist, and which most of you probably who are interested in economic policy see as a formative moment in most of our lives. Um, in tonight's intervention, in her keynote speech, Anne will be providing her views on some of the, the perennial themes of her work, uh, which include the financialization of the economy, um, and a particular focus on the roles and the responsibilities of the market versus regulators and a theme which is now being, I think, uh, scrutinized much more in the context of the Green Deal, having a just ecological transition. Um, the implications for our democracies of this new debate about achieving net zero emissions and having a more sustainable planet. I think you're going to touch upon all of these in a very, a very wide-ranging historical intervention, which will also talk about some of the policies that the European Union has been at the forefront of inventing very recently. And then after Anne uh, has completed her speech, we have two inter interventions, or respondents, I think, formally, um, who will be picking up some of the themes. First of all, we'll be going to Tom Baller, who's a profession professor of ecological economics here at the ULB in Brussels. Uh, Tom will be focusing more on the green and environmental angles uh, in Anne's speech. And then after that, we have Jens van Kloster, who's a, I think formerly a philosopher, uh, given your academic title, whose research will fo focuses on political and financial markets. Jens is a postdoctoral fellow at the KU Leuven, at the Catholic University uh, in Leuven in Belgium. Um, I would encourage you all um, to think about things you would like to put to all three of our panelists. Um, get your intellectual juices flowing because I'm definitely going to hand over to the audience at some point. I think the, the aim is to have a free-flowing, wide debate. I'm encouraging everyone to intervene and interject, um, not too many niceties, because we don't have too much time, so it'd be great to get through everything. Um, Anne, uh, I'm going to hand over to you. I will probably give you a prompt um, when yeah. you might need to wrap up. Please um, do. But for now, you, the next 25 minutes to 30 are yours. So, Anne Petfor, welcome. And thank you for being with us. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you very much. I'm really chuffed to see you all. I thought there wouldn't be anyone here tonight because we'd all be chased away. But uh, we've all made it past all of the COVID um, authorities, which is good. Um, I wanted to begin um, with this image uh, and, uh, and a story that I like to tell, which is about you know a little fish uh, swimming around the ocean, and uh, she's on her own. Let's call her Greta, 
and uh, two old lady fishers come by, and um, as she's passing them, she says, Hi, smiling brightly, um, how are you finding the water? And the old ladies just look at her askance, and they swim on, and when she's out of earshot, the one looks to the other and says, What's water? Right. And I tell the story because it's how we think of globalization. We think of it as something that's a given, it's there all the time, it's never going to change, it's always going to be there, and it's just part of us. And really, you know, what are we talking about? And one of the reasons I wanted to make this speech was because I want to talk about the international system and help us understand that it is there, it is an architecture, it's been created, it's been built by human agency, and it can be dismantled and we can build a new one. And that's going to be the theme of this talk. But because, it, because at the moment is so hegemonic, the, the world order is so hegemonic, uh, people find it almost impossible to talk about. So domestically and also at, at world scale, we've found ourselves separating economics from politics, as Robert Cox once wrote in his book, Production, Power and World Order. The political foundations of this hegemonic system, this economic order, are so taken for granted to be practically ignored. We, we ignore the fact that this was politically constituted. It didn't just happen. It wasn't a question of magic. It, didn't, it wasn't the invisible hand. It was constructed by, by politicians, people, and particularly uh, through a pol political process. But we have to understand that it is there. And it's not invisible, it's not like water, it's not all encompassing. It's actually very uh, it's directional. It's forcing us into certain habits, certain uh, uh, activities which are harmful both to ourselves but also to the uh, uh, ecosystem. So it's disguised as a system that serves the world's consumers, but nevertheless it's been specifically designed and I want to be clear about this, to serve the interests of the billionaire economy, the world's tiny minority of incredibly wealthy individuals and globally dominant monopolies that, for example, emerge from Silicon Valley. It's been designed by them for them. We have globalization for the 1%. And what's been extraordinary through this pandemic, as the billionaires have got richer, they've just got richer and richer, uh, according to the experts, there were more yachts, super yachts, mega yachts sold in 2020 than ever before. And we expect to have records uh, sales this year in 2021. So they have designed and now uphold a globalized financial system that is mostly beyond the reach of regulatory democracy of nation states. It is, it is a system that has stripped governments of what economists call policy autonomy. But here's the thing. While it has done that, and while it's in, enriched the wealthy, the, the wealthy spend only a small percentage of their income on the global economy, not enough to keep the global economy churning. Lower income people, on the other hand, spend almost everything they have, but what they've had, the incomes they've had, have been shrinking. Even while the, the global economy has carried on producing. And so we have this situation, this bizarre situation, where we have dampened down purchasing power and excess production, too much production. And this is leading to debt inflation. We know about this uh, for, for people on uh, stagnant incomes, on incomes and, uh, and on a wage share that's fallen as, share, as a share of the total economy over the last 40 years. Uh, people are borrowing money instead to keep themselves afloat, to keep uh, a roof over their heads, to ensure that they... Um, have sufficient pur purchasing power, and they take on debt for that purpose. So this economy um, poses grave threats, is what I want to argue, to the world economy. This world order poses grave threats to the uh, world economy, and the, and the most serious is economic failure. So we have ongoing economic failure, and you wouldn't think that, 
reading the Financial Times or listening to the radio or watching the television, you'd think things were booming. But in fact, we have massive global imbalances between surplus and deficit countries, between the global reserve currency of the dollar and emerging market currencies, the, the recurring and massive inflation of private and public debt and the inevitable regular deflations of debt. The, stagnant, the, the stagnation of wages worldwide, which I've already referred to, real wage growth has been the lowest for 200 years, with the wealthy enjoying soaring asset prices and the rent from soaring asset prices. Um, high levels of unemployment, uh, as well as insecure, low-paid employment, um, and the asset price inflation has manifested itself now as a crisis of housing all over the world. This is failure. This is the global economy failing us. This is not success. And finally, we have obscene levels of inequality. This too is economic failure. Now, um, what I want to show is that the thing is not stable. And I want to talk you through this chart, which I am fascinated by. It's from the Financial Stability Board, which was set up by Gordon Brown and others after the 2008 crisis. The Financial Stability Board was instructed to monitor the global financial system and keep it stable and prevent the crisis that we had in 2007-9. And their annual report shows the total of financial assets held by those that hold financial assets out in the shadow banking system. The FSB won't talk about the shadow banking system. They talk about um, monitoring non-bank financial intermediation, by which they mean the shadow banking system that exists beyond the frontiers of nation states. Right? And they report that total financial assets managed by this sector now amount to $404 trillion. So total financial assets here means obligations. It means uh, companies like BlackRock holding pensions and pension funds, which involve obligations, payments in the future to pensioners in the future, or insurance contracts, or government bonds, again, promises to pay in the future. So these are all assets held by these institutions, and they amount to $404 trillion, which is like... I mean, it's hard to imagine even what 400... I, I cannot imagine that amount of money. And it's particularly hard to imagine when you consider that the global economy generates income of just $87 trillion a year, right? So these obligations that have to be met at some point are being met by really rather low levels of global income. Nevertheless, uh, you know, this is big potatoes, um, a lot of money, and uh, the FSB has, they, they, I, I haven't been able to reproduce, they have a marvellous chart which shows that in 2010, the sum was only $250 trillion. So the amounts have, have expanded massively since 2007-08. So the key thing about this, um, this is that it amounts to uh, debt inflation, and the way that works is this. A bond is nothing more than a promise to pay. To create a loan, uh, to set up a loan, just involves ensuring that the person who takes out the loan promises to pay in the future. Right? In that sense, it's a social construct. It's, it's a social technology, and it's a wonderful social technology. Humanity invented the social technology way decades, uh, centuries ago in Italy, Holland um, and, in, in, and Antwerp, and the purpose of it was to enable us to do what we can do, to undertake transactions. But if you live in the stratosphere of the shadow banking system, the, the ability to create new promises to pay, to just simply, if you like, um, uh, create these out of thin air, is very, very great, because there's no regulatory system limiting your ability to promise to pay. Because for the promise to pay to work, for credit, credo, I believe you will pay, to work, you need to underpin it with something called trust. And in order to uphold trust, you need the law, contracts, and institutions. So people uphold their promises. Out there, there is no such thing, right? 
So you can create all the promises you like. So what we have here is massive inflation of promises, which are uh, is credit on the one hand, if you like, but debt on the other. And that amounts now, according to uh, the Institute for International Finance, which is the think, bank for, uh, think tank for all banks, amounts now to $300 trillion. So again, I want you to put that against the $87 trillion of annual income from the global economy. And what is happening now as we speak? The billionaires are getting richer, and they've got an awful lot richer during the pandemic. And everyone's wondering, how can this happen? How can this be? Last year, the economy was closed down. The global economy was closed down. It was nationalized. It was sh they, this is called shutdown or lockdown, right? How come they made all this money in this time? Well, in March 2020, when the virus really struck home, the financial sector panicked and suddenly began to ask the question, which they, they, they invariably ask in a, in, a, in a crisis. Well, these assets that I hold, do they, are they really worth this much? Is this how much this asset, this bond, this property, uh, this commodity that I hold, is it, is, is it really worth as much as I paid for it and leveraged additional borrowing against it? I used it as collateral to borrow additionally. And what's happened to this collateral? Is it still the same? And they panicked because they began to feel that it wasn't, that actually their assets might have depreciated in value, may have collapsed in value. But then they'd still have these obligations, the debt that they'd leveraged against the collateral out there. At which point, the Fed moved in and bailed them out. And we were just discussing in the green room that actually we don't talk about the March 2020 crisis as if it was 2007-9. But it was as grave and almost as cataclysmic as 2007-9. But this time, the Federal Reserve, the Bank of England, the ECB, and the Bank of Japan rushed in and bailed out the, the shadow banking system. I couldn't believe their luck. Just, just as after 2007, 8 the bankers couldn't believe that they didn't go to jail. So what's happened then? Um, so what's happened since then is that we have massive asset price inflation. As we all know, anybody who is trying to buy a house or trying to rent property in a city like Brussels or London or wherever, you see this massive inflation in, in, in property prices. What's happening? I'll argue that what is happening is that these holders of what are virtual assets have panicked and began panicking in March 2020, especially when energy and oil stopped flowing as well, because that was a real sign the economy was, was closing down. They, when they panicked, they suddenly realized these virtual assets should be translated into real assets for security. So the money is now rushing from the shadow banking system towards every real asset it can find, uh, they can identify. And of course, real assets are finite. There are just that, that, that many properties in Brussels. England, Britain has only that much land. The ecosystem has only finite supplies of commodities and so on. And so this wall of money aimed at this finite reserve of assets is what's giving us massive um, asset price inflation, which is very destabilizing. So my argument is that the, this system that we prefer not to take notice of is highly unbalanced and highly unstable and likely to inflict some grievous pain on us in due course. But there isn't just economic failure as a consequence of globalization, financial globalization, the globalization of the 1%. There is social upheaval and the rise of far-right authoritarianism. And I want to argue that this is a public reaction to globalization. And it's not an irrational one either. This is the public saying, I can't afford to buy a house. I can't afford to pay the rent that's required of me to live in London or wherever it is in any of the big cities. I can't afford a roof over my head. I can't afford to send my children to university. I feel insecure. My wages are falling. And that's making me feel very insecure. And I'm angry because I can see a lot of people are doing really, really well. 
what I need, and the thing that I notice most of all is that the government is telling me it's got nothing to do with them. When I argue that house prices are too high, the government shrugs their shoulders and says, well, that's the market, honey. When I say university fees have gone through the roof and I can't afford it, the government says, tough, that's the market. Um, and so on and so forth. And so what do I do? I can no longer look to my government, especially if it's democratic government. I'm looking for a strong man or woman to protect me from these market forces that my government is telling me it has no control over, and hence the rise of fascism. And this is what Karl Polanyi predicted back in the 1930s. Didn't predict, he actually explained that this was a consequence of the marketization of all aspects of social and economic life. And he quite rightly said, that fascism is merely the most recent and most virulent outburst of the anti-democratic virus inherent in industrial capitalism, he called it then, I would say in financial capitalism. Fascism is no more than the most recent form of the recurrent attack of capitalism on popular forms of government. Now, that capitalism, financial capitalism, is hostile to democracy, is evidenced by the fact that it prefers to operate beyond the boundaries of regulatory democracy, out there in what we call the shadow banking system. The reason why they've detached themselves from nation states, from governments, from democratic regulatory authority is precisely because they're anti-democratic regulatory authority. And so Polanyi argues that's absolutely fundamental to today's financial capitalism. It's a big threat. We've been there before. We went there in the 1930s, we know what happens. It's not nice. And then the third threat posed by the current world order is climate breakdown and biodiversity collapse. Um, whoops. So um, the collapse of the life support systems essential to the survival of human civilization. Climate breakdown, biodiversity collapse and pollution is accelerated by the system of financial globalization, I argue and uh, by it, this, the ability of largely unregulated, easy and mobile money to power up production, consumption and speculation. That's what they do. And these in turn fuel greenhouse gas emissions, but it gets worse. Big agri-food, big farms, Bill Gates uh, is the biggest private farm owner of farmland in the world, right? Big farms make big flu as Rob Wallace has argued. Capital, he said, he's written, is spearheading land grabs into the last of primary forest and smallholder held farmland worldwide. These investments drive the deforestation and development leading to disease emergence. The functional diversity and complexity these huge tracts of lands represent are being streamlined in such a way that previously boxed in pathogens are spilling over into local livestock and human communities. In short, he argues, and I think he's right, capital centers, places such as London, New York and Hong Kong should be considered our primary disease hotspots. Hot Instead of focusing on Brazil, on the Congo or on Wuhan, we should be focusing on those centers that are drawing, if you like, um, resources from those, from those places, from those forests, from those um, subtropical area, tropical areas. Um, and this is particularly the case with pandemics, and this is where we find ourselves today. And I want to say that what the story normally goes is we're all in the, all in this game, and it's true. Every time we drink coffee, go to the coffee shop or have chocolates, we are raiding a rainforest somewhere. But I'm going to argue tonight that actually our consumption is of nothing as compared to the consumption of the 1% who are driving all of this exploitation of the very last of the ecological assets available to humanity. So this is all bad news. This is a grim story, and I'm sorry to have to give you such a grim story and gloomy. But I want to move now to what I think 
is possible is that um, it's possible to transform this world. And I want to argue, we know. We've done it before. We did it last year. Last year, our governments nationalized the global economy. Last year, you know the story about there is no magic money tree? That story doesn't hold anymore, right? The story about the state should not intervene, that story doesn't hold anymore, right? Because last year, if it weren't for the state, God knows what would have happened to us all. Above all, what would have happened to the shadow banking sector? So I want to argue that we're capable of making fantastic transformational trade and very rapidly. We're capable of a very rapid transition, as we showed last year. But there have been earlier transitions. I mentioned in passing the 15th of August, 1971, when overnight President Nixon dismantled the financial architecture of the day. It was called the Bretton Woods system. Overnight, on his own, three days in Camp David with Paul Falker and others, he goes on the telly and he says, we're no longer going to uh, uphold our obligations to repay our debts in gold, right? We're going to just give it all up. We're giving up the Britain Woods system. Overnight, without any plan in its place. But the one that I want to deal with tonight is the transformation that took place in 1933 under President Roosevelt. Now, he faced three threats as well. Economic failure, 1929, big crash, high levels of unemployment, business failures, agricultural collapse, and so on and so forth. He also faced the rise of the far right and authoritarianism. If you think the concept or the slogan, America first, was invented by Donald Trump, you're very wrong. It was actually a, a slogan used by Randolph William Hearst, that was the media mogul of the time, and who, who A, worshipped Hitler, and B, attacked Roosevelt both before the presidential election and post the presidential election. So the, the rise of fascism in America in 1933 was very, very real and financed by big money. So he faced that, and then of course he faced an ecological crisis, the Dust Bowl. Great, the, great swathes of the plains, swathes of the great plains of the United States had been eroded um, by overuse, by over uh, exploitation. And, um, and, he, and, and, and that had caused ma massive migration from those areas to, for example, California. Anybody who's read The Grapes of Wrath, the Grapes of Wrath will know that story. And I want to argue that the action that President Roosevelt took on the night of his inauguration. On Saturday night, he sat down with his team and he said, we're dismantling the gold standard. And the gold standard was the globalization, the financial globalization of its day. It was effectively government by Wall Street, government of the key uh, elements of the economy. You know, the capital flows in and out of the United States, rates of interest on all loans, and of course, the value of the exchange rate. This was all determined by Wall Street. And he said, we're going to change that. We're going to move the government from Wall Street to my, to my office, uh, Morgenthau's office at the at Treasury. And his staff said to him, well, you can't do that tonight because tomorrow is a holy day, it's a holiday, and uh, people go to church and so on. You're going to have to wait till Monday. And so he said, OK, I'll wait till Monday. He was so anxious to get going with this. And when he closed the banks on Monday, everybody, the story goes that he closed the banks to save the banking system. But he closed the banks to give them time to hand over their gold, bring it up to the Treasury. And thereafter, he sat down and he began to work on the exchange rate, the dollar, the value of the dollar for the United States, and said this is no longer going to be in the hands of Wall Street. The story gets more complicated, but that's roughly what he did, and it was a revolutionary act. It was transformational. And I want to argue that while he was facing fascism, the actions that he took uh, as president uh, to deal with Wall Street were what saved democracy in the United States. If the same had happened here in Europe, we would not have had Hitler, is my argument. And his doing of this is down entirely to this man, um, uh, John Maynard Keynes. And I want to argue here tonight 
that John Maynard Keynes was a revolutionary. He's often described as being about taxing and spending. Uh, his enemies, and he has enemies everywhere, prefer to think of him as being obsessed with fiscal policy, with government spending, with governments bailing out the system and, and relying on fiscal policy. He had no interest in fiscal policy. His famous work is called The General Theory of Employment, which he thought was absolutely essential to stability in an economy. Interest and money. It wasn't the general theory of employment, tax and spend, as his enemies would have us think. And he understood that for a country to change its policies, for a nation to, to stabilize its economy, requires a transformation of the international system. And in particular, he was concerned about um, the, the gold standard. I like to compare him to um, Rosa Luxemburg, who also understood the international system in a way that many of her colleagues didn't. But she differed, he differed from her in many other ways. Um, he, he, he was clear that um, it was possible to subordinate the finance sector to the interests of national democratic states. Um, but he, uh, so he was different from her in many ways, but I'd just like to stress that both of them were revolutionary in their thinking. So he goes to Versailles and he's absolutely disillusioned by what happens in Versailles. Europe is in ruins. People are starving. There are riots and upheavals everywhere, right? The threat of communism. Um, and the leaders care not a fig for what's happening in Europe. And in particular, President Wilson, who's a nationalist, America first, cares not a damn and won't really do anything to help the people of Europe recover. So he comes along and Keynes, in this sense, by now, in a way many different from many other economists, understood money. He understood money as a social technology rather than real exchange based on barter. And he begins to devise a revolutionary plan with key specifications for the redesign of the international financial architecture, departing from the gold standard, as I said, and private authority over the financial system towards a process whereby there would be public authority over the financial system. So his plan is that Germany would issue bonds, promises to pay, right? Sales would raise about a billion uh, dollars at the time. And Germany would have to pay 4% on this within time. But the thing about the bonds that would be different from anything else was that um, they would have priority over all other German obligations. Now, I think Keynes was a genius, but he was also naive because J.P. Morgan was sitting next to President Wilson, advised by a man called Thomas Lamont. J.P. Morgan was as present at the Versailles negotiations as the banks were present at the COP26 negotiations two weeks ago, right? They were all over it. And they'd, because they'd made huge loans to various countries, including Germany, during the First World War. So Keynes was naive, because when he said, look, these bonds that Germany issues will be guaranteed by the United States, Britain, and France. That's all they'd have to do. They'd just have to guarantee them. They wouldn't have to come up with any cash. They'd just have to guarantee them. And then these bonds would have value. Um, he, 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 sees, he sees that these bonds then have value, which enables Germany to raise finance for recovery. And it's only a billion pounds then, but that was a, lot, a billion dollars, but that was a lot of money, right? Germany would begin to recover and then generate her own economic activity and her own, own levels of income. But, and, and, and they would be guaranteed jointly by the big states. What he was hoping for was to develop a new international system where the bonds themselves would become a new acceptable form of payment into allied pavement. It'd become a new sort of form of money, really. And the French could use the bonds to pay debts to the British, and the British could use them to pay debts to the Americans and so on. So he was beginning to plan a inter new international framework. But he, he was foolish enough 
to send this plan to President Wilson, who didn't really read it carefully, and who got Thomas Lamont of J.P. Morgan to respond and say, nonsense, we're not going to have anything to do with this. I tell you this story because the consequences of not adopting Keynes's plan were, as you and I know, catastrophic for Europe. Catastrophic, not just for Europe, but for the rest of the world. Right? And by 1933, um, Roosevelt, who'd been governor of New York City in 1929 when New York City went down, understood the importance of his plan. And so, in, he, so he begins the dismantling of the gold standard in 1933, which is transformational. So then I want to fast forward, and I'm whizzing you through a lot of history here, to Europe, October 2020, and the launch of Corona bonds. After extensive debate and argument, a joint plan to fund economic recovery across the Union from the coronavirus pandemic. Given the neoliberal nature of the Eurozone, it was an implausible initiative driven by countries worst hit by the coronavirus pandemic, Italy and Spain. But it has this in common with Keynes's plan, which is that it was, it was a, an, a, a bond issue backed by all the big uh, uh, all the big European countries, the rich European countries, in support of the countries of the South. And I, I mean, I don't want to go into this at great length because you know about this better than I do. But we know because, uh, as Charles Michel said, this was a historic moment. The decision to borrow together for the sake of investment and reform is to renew, he said, our European marriage vows for the next 30 years. European unity is one through, and more than ever, I think that the message we are sending to our citizens is one of confidence, of solidity, of strength. Now, some might say that's not enough. Many say there's much more to be done, and I, d I agree with that. I agree that this is just a start, but it's a really important start. It's an important start because, once again, these bonds have to take priority over obligations to the private sector, to Wall Street, to the City of London, and so on. So I want to end on this note. The young people are demanding system change. Young people are saying that we cannot tackle this crisis, this climate crisis, without tackling the system. We've got to start talking about how we tackle that system, how we bring about the transformation that will stabilize the ecosystem as well as the economy. And we, for, t for that to happen, we need system change, not climate change, in order to end this disorder, which is now so much a feature of globalization, financial crises, massive inequality, and um, uh, climate breakdown. I'll stop at that point. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anne. Um, that was... Uh that was a, a, a tour de force through modern European economic history. Um, and there's definitely some political themes that I think we'll pick up. Uh, yeah. But before we do that, and before um, I, I try and uh, use, abuse my privilege to ask you some questions, I'm going to hand it over to Tom. So as mentioned, uh, Tom is a professor of ecological economics, which I think is quite a novel title. I don't know how many of those they've been around for the, over the last few decades. Uh, and Tom, you want to pick up on some of the elements about what the green transition will mean for our economy. So um, the floor is yours. Thanks. Sh should I stay here? Yes, you can, you can stay where you are. Yes, I prefer. Uh, thanks for that. <laughs> I wondered why you're speaking so much of James Bond, but uh, whatever. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, I, I'm not a finance person, so I, I cannot comment on what you <laughs> proposed with respect to, to, to finance issues. But uh, yeah, I try to maybe pick up a little, some things which um, are linked to, notably to the Green New Deal, which uh, y your talk also sort of uh, underlined. Um, I, I really might much liked your, your entry into the, the speech, that uh, small fish uh, girl speaking to the two ladies and about the naturalness of the water. I think yeah. that's what you said, the naturalness of the water. Yeah. Uh, and then you said, you know, the, the finance is all over the place, so there's some sort of a naturalness of the finance too. I, I like that because obviously there's naturalness to all of us, uh, to our systems and, and to the economic system in particular. Yeah. It's just a sub 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 system of the bigger social system, which is itself just a sub 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 system of the bigger ecological systems. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think that's a it's a very nice allegory to to a certain extent. And I, I like the, the the way you you 
try to uh, make us think that it, it's to take it serious, basically, you know, about that naturalness. I think that's also that's the specificity about uh, ecological economics uh, people with respect to environmental economists. Uh, we, we, we really think there is something different in terms of understanding the implication of the systems. Mm -hmm. uh, the economy is a subsystem of all the rest. And, mm -hmm. and so if, if you want to deal with the economics, and in particular finance being a subsystem of economics, you need to, to take nature much more seriously than what you're doing to, today. Now, I, I have just a very small comment, which is really much, uh, I, 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 I run my computers on Apple. I, I'm not particularly keen of Microsoft, but Bill Gates is not the, 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 the most important private person in terms of land ownership. Do you know who it is? No. It's an English lady, 95, 96 year old. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm saying so private, private ownership. She's yeah. private. Yeah, I suppose that sort is of. true. She's yeah. a privateer, isn't she? Yeah, yeah, she is extent. indeed. So, uh, yeah, she has 40,000 40, or 400,000 acres more than Bill Gates. Uh, <laughs> right. On your island, so it's even... Uh, it's, it's, yeah. Um, no, a little bit more serious. Um, so, I, the Green New Deal, yeah, I, th I think what, what, your, what your talk shows is that... Um, is there a deal? Yeah, there's, there's deals. Uh, in, in the economics and particularly in the finance world's, uh, world, it seems there, there seems to be a lot of deals. I was working myself um, some time ago on, on indicators and on GDP and how, how that thing was invented and Keynes had quite some say about that also at that time. Mm -hmm. And um, even GDP, even, even the measurement of what economy is, uh, mm -hmm. is a deal. Uh, it's it's mm -hmm. it's a political deal. It's it's a political object. Mm -hmm. It's it's not flowing naturally from economics as being a science. Even if we, if some of us think it is a science, which which probably it is not, because it's a social science. It's it's yeah. nothing else. So there's deals. Yeah, that's for sure. There's no problem with that. And I think it's normal to see the economics as being something which is under deals and under vested interests. Ah, it's just about sharing uh, or, or, or taking the big, biggest part. So it's, it, that's not new. It, that's the way it is thought. Mm -hmm. No, that's why it is the way it is. Um, is it new then? You know, because it's called Green New Deal. It, it's not new. You, you, you showed yourself it's not that new because mm. a, a guy maybe almost 100 years ago already had a new deal. So even that was probably not new. But the, the one we're having now in Europe is not that new. Mm. Um, it's just a way of spending money. And I think the, one of the reasons, and I think you, you, you showed that also quite nicely, one of the reasons we have it is that it doesn't question the world order as it is. Uh, it distributes money, big money, to people who have big money, and they are supposed then to do something with it. You didn't speak about it, but in, in, in the notes you, you sent us up front, uh, you, you were speaking uh, uh, about the thing that you what that taxonomy they have at the European level, uh, which mm -hmm. is supposed to save us quite a way into the Green New Deal, which, which in itself, you know, you, you don't, uh, there's no questioning of, of, of how to do money, how to do economics in, in that. It's just, so in that sense, I, I, would, I would not call it a New Deal. It's just uh, doing things as, as it has been before. Mm -hmm. And if then you take serious the small fish sort of comment, you know, uh, there's naturalness which you need to respect. Uh, yeah. You probably cannot do that new economy with the old sort of type of economy. And uh, so I, I'm very skeptical about the Green New Deal. I, I think it's a good idea, basically, but it, it leaves the same people at, at, with the same idea pursuing the same sort of stuff they did for the last 250 years or something like that. So, Is, is this just a, a sort of debate about um, redirecting flows of money to make consumption in other areas? And, and is the point you're trying to get to is that we just need less consumption? I think that, yeah, I think so, yeah, yeah. Because green, it's, it's, if, if you want to take it seriously, then uh, every form of production and consumption is, is generating impacts. And we are generating too, 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 too many impacts anyway. So the only way to tackle that, to tackle the constraints and the limits, is, is to, to turn it down. So, so what I'm arguing is that I agree with you. I think you're right. But if you have, a f if you have say, a spigot, a tap of credit, and it's throwing credit out, the credit is aimed at production and consumption. Mm -hmm. And what it, uh, Greens say, what, it, what my friends, the environmentalists say, we must stop the consumption. And I'm saying, you must switch off the credit spigot. 
because so long as this spigot is spewing out new money for expenditure on production and consumption, you won't be able to stop it. That's all I'm saying. But I agree with you that, of course, you know, for us to survive, we have to change. I mean, I, I haven't had time tonight, I've covered too much territory already, to talk about you know, what a green and sustainable economy is. And it, it, but it's one that, that we've got to be able to manage. Right now, we can't manage it. It's beyond us. It's, it's beyond our ability to manage. And the creation of credit is beyond us <coughs> as well, is beyond our institutions. So this credit is being spewed out, $404 trillion of it. And it's going to burn up production consumption and it's going to, you know, deforest most of our tropical forests. That's my point. So yeah, we don't I, disagree. Yeah, I, I think we do disagree. I think uh -huh. it's, it's... All right, let's disagree. I think we're looking at the same, at the same object, but from different perspectives. Uh, one other thing I'm working on is, is, is that, that idea of transitions, transformations of societies. And I'm, like, I'm, an, I'm an economist by, by, by training, so I, if I speak with... with other economists, colleagues, or something like that, the way they look at, at transitions is, is basically what I call it, they have an innovation bias. They think of it of, of being a new society, a new deal, you know? Mm -hmm. But they don't think of what we need to shut down bef before we have that new deal. Mm -hmm. And it's obvious in the energy se sector, for instance, if you don't shut down the coal, mm -hmm. you won't have all the rest because of the vested interests. Uh, and as long as we don't name that, that end point, it, we, we have difficulties in addressing it, I think. And, and then we're speaking about the means and how to achieve something, but we are not clear about what we wanted to achieve to a certain extent. Tom, if I may, th I think there's a lot of obfuscation around climate policy, and, and we saw that at COP, and two words that are banded around a lot and things that I, I write in my news stories and don't necessarily unpack is climate mitigation and climate adaptation. Uh, and when we talk about uh, you know, the first phase of, of getting serious about the Green Deal, these two words are used, uh, and some people are, are, are big fans of the adaptation point, whereas perhaps we're in a more conservative mitigation element. Could you maybe kind of explain what that means in the, wor in the, in the world that you're in? And is there a kind of, as you said, an innovation bias and maybe some inherent conservatism when we think about just mitigating the risks rather than actually doing something that is truly, as you said, new or not new in some cases? Yeah, I think so. I think so. I'm, I'm not pretending I have, I have the truth, but I, I, what, I, what I miss is that we're looking at, uh, try to look at, at things from different perspectives, basically, and try to argue about that. And, and I've, th there's definitely innovation bias. You, you showed Charles Michel, he's, he's a super innovation. He, he thinks technology will do it. I mean, he's Belgian, and he's, he's from the Liberal Family Party. He's, he's, he's <laughs> <laughs> they strive for, I mean, this, the, what, what they strive at the national level, and it's, it's certainly not him personally, what, but what his group strives on the national Belgian level is, is, is uh, solve it with technology. And, and uh, mm -hmm. even if that would be possible, it wouldn't go fast enough, so it's no good. And, and then, what you showed your last image, that we need system change. Uh, I think we need to be clear about what, what the system then is. Well, so. I am talking about the financial system. Yes, And yes, I'm yes. saying the financial system is creating the ecological crisis. And you're saying you disagree? You don't think the financial system is causal? You think what's causal is technology? I think it's part, part of the story. It's not causal, but, but the thing is, if, if, if you... If you if you aim towards a smaller economic system, you, you obviously probably need smaller money. But you can't. In a globalised world, it's not possible. Yeah, this is what I agree with that. That's yeah, and that's my that's, point, yes. that if we want to... And I, I, if you read my book, which I haven't talked about tonight, I'm about having more self-sufficient economies. You know, we've got to probably stop eating chocolate and drinking coffee and consuming what it is we make at home, really. I'm in favour of much more restrained consumption within the limits within our own ecosystem instead of exploiting third world countries and so on. So I'm in favour of all of that, but we can't, we can't do that in the world of globalised finance. We don't have the powers, uh, you know, we don't... That's my point. OK, maybe, Jens, <laughs> I'll bring you in to talk a bit more on the market side and then we mm -hmm. can perhaps uh, get 
a bit more into the debate. So, Jens, mm -hmm. please give us your kind of initial comments on Anne's intervention. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thanks a lot. And I thought this was really, really huge, big picture story. And I think it sort of relates immediately to this question mm -hmm. that's on the table of, OK, where are we now? Where are we going? Are we going in the direction of like a dramatic change that will, will solve some of these issues? Mm -hmm. Or are we just in a you know, show of greenwashing and actually mm. in three, five years from now we'll think actually uh, nothing happened. And then, of course, you look at history to mm. get an idea of where might things be going. Yeah. Where, what do you want to look at? Um, and in that regard, I think at this moment is just genuinely unclear, right? The moment you mentioned the um, the closing of the gold window by Nixon, mm. the election of, of Roosevelt. Nobody thought on day one this is going to be hugely transformational. Mm. So I just wanted to pick up a bit on, on what we should be looking at to even answer this, this question, right? So what mm. would tell us, yes, your, your transformation is happening? Uh, well, first, ideas probably will not tell us very much, right? So the world that came out of Keynes' ideas, the actual Bretton Woods systems, was completely different from anything he envisaged. Mm. And in the same way, maybe you could think of Hayek as the sort of the big philosopher of the shadow money, mm -hmm. denationalized currency that happened. Yeah. Both these men hated what, what came out of their ideas. And I worry that once your ideas will be realized, you will feel sort of the same. <laughs> <laughs> so that's as a, as a, as a warning. Um, and then as you, as you um, went to at the end and that what, what, what's happening at the moment, we see all these policy initiatives which look sort of ambitious and new mm -hmm. on the face of it. Central banks giving out all the money. Mm -hmm. uh, also some early initiatives, the green taxonomy to go for, for green lending. There's even an international tax agreement, right? But it looks nothing like tax policies in the 50s. Mm. So there, I gu guess, it's just genuinely unclear where, where things might be happening. Now, I may, might say one thing constructive on, on what should tell us that we're not there yet mm -hmm. and what would maybe tell us that we are heading in the right direction. And I think that's wha what you also ended on. At the moment, you see these things happening, but in a very opaque, mm. technocrat-led, mm. EU-level, uh, global regulation level. And it's still quite far removed from democratic politics, right? So yeah. the way in which the welfare state related directly to people's everyday concerns, the way in which even the turn towards neoliberalism in the 70s and 80s related in a very direct way to people's concerns about employment and inflation. Mm -hmm. I think that's very striking yeah. at the current juncture, that that connection doesn't seem to be there in the same way. You know, you've already warned about the issues of, of fascism, but I think that is sort of what's, what's at the moment still sort of missing, mm -hmm. and I think where any, any real big transformations of the financial system would, would need to happen. Now, of course, your work is, again, pivotal in, in making that connection of, of people's lives to the financial system. But also, I mean, I guess we all, all know this, this is just obscure stuff, right? I mean, you, I mean, mm -hmm. you work every day to bring this to readers, but it's not so clear yeah. where the democratic energy for, for these transformations sure. would uh, come from. Yeah, no, that's really, I mean, I, 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 um, I don't want to exhaust us all with thinking about these things, but I think you're absolutely right. And what is not in the, in the speech are the answers, what we need to do, the next steps. But I think the point of the speech was to say, please let us understand we're living in this water. It's there, you know. Uh, we don't talk about that. We're focused on our economy here, on the politics here, on everyday politics, on what's happening and so on. We even focused on the, on the ecosystem. We, we noticed that birds are becoming extinct and so on. And this thing that is operating out there, we, we're not focused on it. So for me, that has to pre predate the real changes that we need. And I don't say I've got all the answers, but if you're not even aware of this thing, 
then how can you do anything? So for me, the, the main task of this presentation tonight was to raise awareness of this. Now, how to deal with it? I have, I have lots of ideas and I wrote some of them down, but I've managed not to say them all. You know, I think we have to subordinate the financial system to the interests of the domestic economy, but also to the ecosystem. Now, that's a big, big idea. How do you do that, really? And there are ways of doing it, and capital controls is one of those ways. Uh, the thing that I think we should be doing more than anything else is by acknowledging that the financial system, those that $400 trillion, those billionaires, rely on us for their wealth, right? So when you think about central banks bailing out in March 2020, uh, Wall Street, essentially, and the city of London and, and Frankfurt. Central banks are public institutions. Mm -hmm. They're built by taxpayers, essentially. The uh, governors of those central banks who pretend to be independent are all civil servants. They are politically appointed, right? They're civil servants. They're on the, the, tax, they're on the payroll that our taxes pay for. Right. So these institutions um, and, and these public institutions are what big finance needs to survive and to, you know, every time it's bailed out. And what do we do? We sit there saying, well, you know, let that happen. You know, it's, it's a good thing they've bailed but in, out. In bailing out the financial system, they're also bailing out the every ordinary man. I mean, the story... That's what we're told. The story in Europe up until 2015 and the seminal moment, I mean, nobody remembers March 2020, but everyone remembers Mario Draghi's whatever it takes. Yeah. Um, the debate in Europe and the frustration in Europe up until that point was the inactivity, relative inactivity of the European Central Bank because parts of the Eurozone, the worst parts of the Eurozone were stuck in a deflationary cycle. I mean, they mm. were told by the Commission and others that the way that they had to um, improve their situations was to adjust uh, yeah. And that means, um, you know, adjusting costs domestically in your labour market, etc. And that was a form of punishment. But the ECB coming in and saying, well, actually, guys, we've got this. They bailed out not just the financial system, but also the Eurozone to some extent, which means people could go to the ATMs the next day and know that things would be OK eventually. And, and I guess the, we're so inextricably linked our, the economy with the health of the financial system that when stocks go down, people maybe will feel poorer themselves yeah. too. Um, so, I mean, I don't want to be the defender of central banks, but no, no. they are stuck. I think this is a really important point. You make a very important point. Um, the first of all, they have helped to construct this deregulated system. They presided over this. They've said it's a good idea for markets to make these decisions, right? And they were sitting on their butts saying, no, no, let the market sort this out. Now, when the market sorts things out, it can be very destructive, right? And when it came close to destruction, the people said, for God's sake, do something. And so they bail out. But it's a reaction to the system that they've partly created. So they, they presided over, they've presided over 40 years of de debt deflationary policies and said, this is fine. You know, this is the way the market works. And, uh, and, and not intervened to regulate, not intervened. You know, so I, I, I personally don't object to the private banking system being bailed out. Because you're right, we're all we're all um, we're all dependent on it. What I object to is that it's bailed out without terms and conditions. You know, if you bail out the banks, you should say we'll bail you out, but you will pay your taxes at home where you've made profits, right? We'll bail you out. We'll we'll look after you, but these are the terms and conditions. You will invest in your economies. You will invest in sustainable activity. You will stop investing in speculation and unsustainable activity. That's what we should say. We don't say anything. We say, yeah, you want to be bailed out? Bailed out. You know, we pre so, so I, you know, central bankers are responsible for the conditions which have created the crises which they then have to sure. bail out. Sure, sure. So I don't feel, you know, too grateful to them. Uh, because they shouldn't have presided over yeah. that in the first place. I mean, one of the other tensions that I wanted to get at in, I think, this speech is, I think, the tension between unilateralism and multilateralism. Yeah. So you mentioned two big events, seismic events in the in the modern history of, of of economics, and one is the decision 
to leave the gold standard, mm -hmm. and the other one was the abolition of the Bretton Woods, uh, sorry, the, the delinking of the dollar with gold. And these were made, as you said, by the great men of history who sat in a room and thought, um, we're going to do this and the rest yeah. will have to follow. And that was a system in which there was a clear hegemon that behaved like a hegemon and whose behavior was such that the rest had to take notice. Yeah. We now no longer live in such a hegemonic system. We have a, a, a multipolar world where people consider, the European Union, for example, considers China and US to be its geopolitical rivals. The US considers China to be its geopolitical rival, and mm. maybe when they bother, they do take pay some attention to the EU, but not so much. Um, and China, of course, also sees itself uh, in this sort of zero-sum game. So in terms of whether there are accurate historical precedents for us getting it right, is it questionable whether the geopolitical conditions exist where you can have a system by which you can take unilateral decisions where the rest have to follow brave decisions, as you say, because those strong men, uh, it's not that they don't exist, there's quite a few of them now, and they compete against each other actively. So, you know, maybe that's, I, I want to temper some of the optimism about whether history tells us we can still do this again the right way. Well, yeah, so, you know, I mean, what, <laughs> what's the alternative? Should we just despair? I um, I take your point about the hegemon, but I think partly the instability is also because of the shifting of the hegemony from one power to the other. But Europe is in a strong position. You know, if I I, I see these great three great powers, Europe is the one that at least has some roots in democracy and has some roots in 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 social welfare. Right? That's not true of the United States, and it's certainly not true of China. Um, and of the, of the three, I think Europe is, is, has the potential to exercise progressive leadership. Whether it will rise to that is a good question. And, I, and, and I, if, if it doesn't, I do despair, right? But I'm not prepared to despair and to give up. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, yeah, no, I, I wanted to maybe push you a bit on whether we've not put more requirements on banks in the past 10 years in a way that would make you more optimistic. So on the one hand, all the stuff that happened around anti-money laundering, really saying like, look, if you are doing this public function, then make sure that this is not used for, for criminal purposes. Yeah. And then maybe also more hopefully than justified by evidence, there is a push to get banks to do more on green lending. The ECB just published uh, last year all these expectations for banks to do green lending yeah. well, right? Look at the green criteria, every step of credit provision. A week ago, they failed them on all these expectations, and there, yeah. there seems to be some push there to revise things, to maybe yeah. make them more into these public So the thing circles. is, what we have is we've got a, 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 an international network of greening the financial system of all the central banks working with the Bank for International Settlements, and they're stumbling forward, and they, they, they're balking at uh, the taxonomy, the de declaration of whether an asset is a green asset or a brown asset. And even if they recognize and favor green assets and green bonds, they're not willing to penalize brown bonds. So they're not willing to uh, penalize fossil fuel companies. But the pressure is building, and it's coming from progressive forces. You know, um, It can be done here, because we do live within some form of democracy still in Europe. That's not the case in China. Uh, the United States, I, have, I feel very worried about it. I think we're going to have Mr. Donald Trump back next year. And then God knows where we will be. So if Europe isn't going to offer leadership, uh, and, and I agree, some, there is progress already being made. That's why I'm mentioning Europe. That's why I'm mentioning the solidarity bonds, because I think there are the seeds here of something which could exercise leadership internationally. Um, and if Europe doesn't op offer that leadership. God help us, really. Um, Tom, you mentioned the taxonomy. It's a story that I'm, I've been following for the last couple of years. I don't know how much of a splash it's made in your world, but 
so you know, Anne sort of laid out the the sort of the general theme of, of distinct, terribly worded classics, uh, sort of mm, Brussels uh, title, a taxonomy. But what it really is is sort of labeling system yeah. to help investors and markets decide whether something, an economic activity, is green by a certain scientific standard, or in some say, cases light green or brown. Um, yeah. And it will, by creating the standard that people agree on, it will help redirect private capital flows into the right areas and potentially yeah. then also penalize those that do not come under the green standard. It, it looks like maybe in the next couple of weeks that the European Commission will say that things like uh, nuclear power and even gas will be considered green. Um, I think there's already been a clamor. I think in the um, in the Place Luxembourg today, there was a funeral for the taxonomy, which was held by the environmental campaigners. They're already very down on it. I mean, is this kind of a litmus test for actually the EU's credibility that the European Union says that it will be driven by science, but the fact that it's made up of 27 member states means that invariably, and I think inevitably, everything comes down to politics, really. And, and, and this creation of, for example, a taxonomy that will include nuclear and gas is because there are a sizable number of European countries. Because of the countries. lobbyists in Brussels. But the yeah. lobbyists are actually those member states. The lobbyists in this yeah. case are France or yeah. Poland, who do yeah. not want their national energy mixes or certain technologies, for example, nuclear technology, which is you know, a crown jewel for some countries in, in their countries, their energy mix, to be penalized by a scientific Brussels regulation. So, I mean, are we already having opportunities and, and they're being missed? Yeah, but it's the really a surprise. <laughs> I mean, that's that. that if you if you hand hand the the, the steering over to 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 the people who uh, who define the system up up front, you know what? How yeah, why hand over the, why why hand it over to them? Why don't we get a grip of this? Yeah, or whoever, why don't the but green not, movement get a grip of this? Whoever, not them, but not them. No, I I think it's it's uh, I, I'm I think it, people sincerely try to address the climate climate issue which is not the environmental issue, which is way more complex. The climate issue is super, super easy because you have one indicator and you know exactly it, it's coming. It's, it's not, the atmosphere is not a living being. Right? It's not like species, it, which is much more complicated. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that there's quite some sincerity about that, uh, about trying to address it. But I think there's also quite some looking at this as being an opportunity between the states and between China to, to, to handle the European competitiveness, sort of. You know, it's it's uh, the, the Germans are super have been at one point super quick in 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 renewables, not because they love, but it's industrial policy. It's nothing else. Uh, and once all all the solar pa solar panel producers and the windmill producers were not German anymore, they didn't really. You know, the, 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 in Germany, the, the energy transition is stuck basically. Because you know it doesn't make sense anymore industrially in terms of industrial policy to invest in it as a political issue. It's it, it's not interesting anymore. Um, so I think there's sincerity. But the the problem is if you look at oh, the problem, um, if if you're looking at the people who are trying to decide on what you know scientifically what it takes, what is in and what is out, these people didn't know how to spell climate ten years or five or five years ago. So it, that's a little bit of a problem, I would say. You know uh, if if. It's, it's not as easy as that. And if you try to generate a new system with the old tools, you know, who's coming up with the taxonomy? Who, who, I have no idea who came up, but I can guess it's somebody from a consulting firm, because that's how things work in the managerialization of the environment. You invent some criteria, you know, and you try to say what is in, what is out. No, but no, it's, it's no, sort no, of no. politically... The, cent the central banks have got huge powers. They yes. have the power to provide liquidity to a corporate in exchange for a bond. If that power is used to reject that bond and to say, sorry, fossil fuel companies will not have access to central bank resources, that's a huge power. Yes, but and, they don't do and, that. And the green movement and, and also progressive movements have been arguing that the central bank should use that power to redirect um, the economy, in a sense. And they were saying, no, let's leave it to the market. Right. So I want us to be more 
as citizens to understand these are huge powers and these are institutions using powers in our name and thanks to our taxes. If with, without us paying our own taxes, they wouldn't have that power to give liquidity to a fossil fuel company in Poland or wherever it is. Now, of course, there's a lot of politics involved here because we're all affected when we switch off the heating, right? When the lights go out, we're all affected and we don't want the lights to go out and we don't want the heating to go off. So, so we are part of the problem in that sense. Yeah, and I do think we agree, but the, the thing is if we stay, you know, if you, hand, if, you hand up, if you leave the power with the economists at the central banks or wherever they are sitting, you don't generate another economic system, you just generate the same thing. Yeah. You should give it to philosophers. Well, exactly, <laughs> that, that's my point. We've yes, left yes. them to their own devices. No, 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 it was not a joke. I mean, it, if, yeah. if you don't have a clear idea, and another idea than we have right now of what justice is, Mm. There was a slide about climate justice, you know, then you have to have an idea of justice, to paraphrase some. Yeah. And, and that is then, you know, that is, you, you have to turn to philosophers, so... I'm, I'm sorry, sorry, Jens, go ahead. No, no, it's... You've... Um, yeah, well, look, I think justice is certainly part of the story, but also, I think, in many ways, we just don't know the way forward yet, and really reflection on the idea of justice. I say that in all modesty, as a philosopher, right? That's That's not going to get us where where we need to go and i think well that that is sort of tr trial and error uh, uh, at the moment and it's of course unsurprising that the people making those moves are the people who are already in the companies with the expertise mm. there in uh, mm. government there um, but on on that note and i want to ask you so you focus quite a bit on look the central banks the companies mm. what about lifestyle choices right so you do think if we're really going to have this huge transition cutting emissions in, in nine years' time, then surely people's lives are going to change dramatically. And mm. that, that, that must in some way be part of the, the puzzle. Yeah, I think that must be the case. But the point is what, what, the, what the fossil fuel companies have succeeded in doing is describing us as all the problem, actually. Whereas I think the 1% are the problem really, that if we cut the consumption, and Professor Kevin Anderson, who I work with closely, who's professor at Tyndall University in Manchester, argues that the top 10% consume as much emissions as the bottom 50% across Europe. So really, um, you know, when you think of Africa, if you think even of European consumers, their levels of consumption don't come anywhere near the top. So if you stop the top 1% from buying, uh, you know, jets, Gulfstream jets, mega yachts, mm -hmm. mansions, masses of land um, and so on, then you would be begin to change the system. Well, you'd be changing the system much more radically than if you just blame everybody. And because this idea of blaming everybody is, leads to impotence, essentially. You know, we, we've all, and I, I have no power, but I'm to blame. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Whereas the, the, the rich who do have the power, if they would just change their habits, we would get a great transformation. And what I'm going to uh, hand it over to the floor in a minute, but one other political issue I wanted to get hold of was sort of your views on, on populism and how inequality and a broken financial yeah. system has fed populism. This is perhaps you know, the biggest, uh, I think, intellectual question of our day. What drives mm. modern day populism? And, and there's a general kind of framing which says it's economics, and some people say it's cultural, that there is a division. And there is so far not a huge amount of empirical evidence that suggests most of this uh, rush towards nativist parties, as we call them in Europe, or mm. proto-authoritarians, or, or fascists, you may say, uh, or right-wing parties at the very most, that there is some element of a primal scream of a, of a, of a, of a demographic that is at the bottom of society and doesn't mm. feel like it's getting better. But these people, uh, these strong men, also have votes from the people who have it pretty easy, the yeah. very, very rich, who are also attracted by Brexit yeah. or Geert Wilders yeah. or the Vlaams Belang in Belgium or Donald yeah. Trump. Yeah. So what explains that? And surely cultural factors, migration, open borders, a sense of identity crises mm. in rich Western countries with lots of rich, uh, well-off people, isn't that have some part in this story that actually it's much more multifaceted than just thinking about 
uh, their material conditions? So I don't think it's cultural. I think it's economic. I think it's due to imbalances. I think migration is happening because of disintegration of economies far away, right? Um, you know, migration is happening because we've smashed up the Middle East as far as we can, right? Migration is happening from parts of Africa which have, you know, been liberalized and deregulated and where there's no employment, effectively, with, where incomes and wages are low, where people don't have housing. Um, you know, people are desperate, and this is the system we've created, a system where the markets will decide whether or not you have a house or whether you have an income or whether you, you can be fed. So this, this system of marketization of every aspect of life has caused massive disruption, including movement of people. People don't, not, don't easily move from their home base, from their home cultures, from where they have family and, 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 and roots and so on, but they're forced to move by economic failure, right? And what do we do? We, we, we address the symptom, not the cause, right? What are we doing about restoring economic prosperity in Africa? For, and I come from Africa, so I feel very strongly about this. Um, we exploit Africa. We can't use our Apple phones without the cobalt and the other minerals that we extract from the Congo. But we do nothing to compensate the people of the Congo for that massive wealth that we're extracting. And, and they are impoverished, their lives are unstable, they are insecure, and naturally, they, they, and then they watch telly and they see how well off the West is and they naturally move. So I, I think they are, this is economic, fundamentally, um, and, and the rise of authoritarianism, the rise of racism and fascism is about how to protect ourselves from this instability. Um, and this volatility in the global economy. And so this, and I'm not endorsing it. I, I think it's horrifying, really. I, I just don't want us to go back to the 1930s, but I think we're causing it through this system of financial globalization. Thank you. Anyway, okay. I've said quite enough. I think we're going to take three questions in, in a batch, so we'll be able to get through them faster. It's very difficult to see. But we will go in the front row. There's someone in the middle. Sorry, um, you can go and then we'll, yeah. Okay. Sure. That's fine. Uh, good evening, Anne. Thank you so much for your uh, excellent presentation. And, and thank you for your responses. Uh, thank you for your responses as well. My name is Ana Margarida Esteves. I'm a sociologist, mm -hmm. originally from Portugal. Mm -hmm. And my question is about what we can call a kind of narrowing of the political imagination. Uh, several social scientists have already written about that. One thing, that I f one, th one thing that I find absolutely horrifying about, about this pandemic is how it's reducing every single question to a, every single answer to every po uh, possible question to a kind of all or, all or nothing kind of thing. Mm -hmm. You were talking about critiques to the notion of progress and, to, and, and critiques to technology as the solution to absolutely every, pro every pro problem. Mm. During the last two years, I've had some, uh, some conversations with people whom I thought were quite level-headed, mm -hmm. whom I thought were qu quite actually open-minded, mm -hmm. but who ended up uh, falling into a kind of mindset that actually feeds their own egos very well, which is, okay, I'm pro-science, I have a degree in, in, some scientific, in some hard scientific field, so science is everything. And if you question that I post on Facebook the title of, uh, the, the title of, of an article in, in, which the, in which the Secretary General of the United Nations criticizes uh, Jeff Bezos for, for, for going to space, <laughs> if you criticize that, you are a populist, you are anti-scientist, you are an, are an obscurantist, but oh dear, Dear darling, if Anna Harent was alive today, mm -hmm. she would probably write a totally different book than the, the origins of totalitarianism. And these were the, the words of a person with an unfinished degree in astronomy. I find this extremely worrying. Mm -hmm. Right now, I'm, I'm a social scientist. I'm a believer in science. However, I, f I find it extremely dangerous that we, that we see science as as the solution to everything. This, 
this can lead to a, to a big dystopia. This can lead to a, to a total emptying of creativity, of imagination, and of the possibility of imagining alternative futures. Thank you. Um, I, to the I hope I was clear. Sorry, that's yeah. maybe more of a comment than a question, but yeah. Gentleman at the front. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, great discussion, and thanks to my friends for actually bringing me in tonight. Uh, uh, I just, actually, it's uh, sort of a bit of a simple question, I suppose, or maybe not that simple. I remember I lived in London when, when sort of this uh, uh, austerity narrative of uh, George Osborne and, and that government of, of uh, mm. David Cameron uh, w was in power, and, and effectively Angela Merkel presiding over that system of austerity throughout Europe. So yeah, yeah. we were made to believe that that was the only way out of, of uh, that crisis, right? And uh, I would argue that led to Brexit, that led to many, many of these uh, movements that Maureen actually mentioned, these sort of atavistic nationalist tendencies. Mm -hmm. And then you, you sort of made it, uh, you know, you put it much more, more articulate than I ever would, that basically last year changed everything. Mm -hmm. And there was sort of money on the trees. There was everything there for the people. So I think that brings me to the, you know, to the point that you have there, internationalism for the many, not the few. You know, how would you reconcile these two bits, these two extremes, you know, I think because the last part, last year, we saw, you know, there could be a lot of things for the many, yeah. whereas in the, in the, those, you know, austerity narrative, there was, you know, there was nothing. We, we, sh we should have sort of tightened our bel belts to survive, you know. To yeah. me, these are like really big extremes that challenge this sort of uh, yeah. narrative. Thank you. Thank you. And then we have the gentleman right uh, much up top in the middle. Sorry, not you, but maybe we'll come back to you, maybe. Just behind. Just behind you, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Um, my question is kind of about populism, but it also touches on this idea of economics versus culture and also who's to blame, whether it's everyone or the 1%. Mm -hmm. um, first of all, thanks for your presentation, Anne. It was, it was fascinating. Um, I suppose my kind of theory or the thing that I've become more and more aware of growing up and kind of understanding the issues a bit more is that actually economics creates the culture. Um, to take the example from the UK, um, my grandparents grew up in a council house which they then got the right to buy, thanks to Margaret Thatcher. Yeah. That was an active decision by a government to kind of push an entire generation of people to a more property-owning, yeah. individualistic mindset. Yeah. Um, you can see it in kind of every element of our culture from, you know, follow your dreams, you know, you two can have X, Y, and Z. Uh, you know, don't worry too much about how the electoral system works, but you can vote for your favorite X Factor contestant, and people are kind of funneled, you know, I think deliberately to a kind of um, yeah. tacit acceptance of the way things are. So given that we have to vote for the leaders who will eventually solve this problem, uh, I think we do all have a role to play in a sense of responsibility, but I wonder, maybe this is for everyone, but particularly for Anne, I guess, how do you think we kind of remove the, the blinkers from the eyes of society because these aren't things that are unique to the UK or the United States. They're ideas that have been kind of exported almost everywhere around the world. And I think that actually addressing that is maybe the fundamental issue. And also just to touch on the, the last comment by the gentleman downstairs, I think Brexit was not so much triggered by austerity, but also by this kind of like complicit decision over a period of decades by elements of the British media to make people feel alienated from international institutions which stood in the way of uh, some of the worst extremes of neoliberal government. So, yeah, I, I, I think that, you know, there's been a kind of, like, a, a serious decision made or an effort made to kind of um, lull people into believing this is the only way to run an economy. And I wonder how you think we kind of set people free from this kind of very kind of individual, individual, individualistic narrative we've created. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so maybe we can start with uh, maybe the uh, yeah, scientific think, um, dictatorialism. Yes, I think all, question, all three questions have this in common, you know, the, the dominance of a kind of ideology of science, you know, uh, epitomized by Elon Musk and, and Jeff Bezos, the ideology of austerity, you know, and this, the, the privatization of all aspects of our lives, you know, the, we've been buried in all this. So... You know, I, um, it's so dominant, it's really hard to speak out of it, speak outside of it, really. And when you do speak, it's very hard to, to sound sensible, really. But um, 
I, I, I just think about my experience. So I worked on sovereign debt in the 2000s, and I, I was very fortunate. I was out of Britain, and I had a kind of eagle-eye view of the world because I was working with the low-income countries. I could see the rich countries, the rich creditor countries, exploiting them, and so on and so forth. And so I wrote this book called The Coming First World Debt Crisis, and it fell like a lead balloon. You know, everybody thought, oh, this is just another lefty, and she's just do-mongering. And then the crisis happened. <clears throat> and I expected progressive forces, people on the left, whom I would expect to exercise leadership here, to say, wow, look, what they've, look what's happened, and we've got to rebuild this. But what I found was people just st stood there with their mouths open. You know, the government of the Bank of England wasn't expecting this crisis. Most orthodox economists wasn't predicting the crisis. The Financial Times didn't predict the crisis, but also the left. The left had thought, again, this comes back to the fishes, you know, in the sea. The left had taken the view that globalization was a fait accompli. It was there. And we never, so there was no alternative plan. There was no other ideas, basically. And so what you're all talking about is the dominance of, some, of one ideology, like austerity. I mean, I found the austerity debate just awful, really, to watch it. And then last year, it was all overturned, overnight. We had a magic money tree, overnight. You know, the state could nationalize the whole sectors of the economy, and we all did very well, or we did relatively well. So, so I think what I'm trying to say is that those of us who regard ourselves as being progressive, as wanting human rights and wanting to save the ecosystem, caring about the environment, we've got to inform ourselves of the way in which the system operates and the way in which, until we change that system, we're going to carry on with this kind of ideology. They've got us in their grip. Elon Musk, I've, I'm very biased against him because he's, <laughs> he's a white South African male and I grew up amongst them and they're not a pretty sight on the whole, really. Um, you know, this guy is behaving like he's God and we're treating him as if he is, you know, because he's, because he's used state funds massively subsidised by the state to invent something new um, and we're idolizing that. I mean, this is, this, is a, this is a society, in my view, in a state of degradation, really, cultural degradation. But where, is, where are the progressive voices? Where is the left? Where are those who regard themselves as being forward-thinking and wanting to change the world in a positive, in a good way? What are they doing? You know, why are they allowing this to happen? So this is how I felt. I watched 2007-9... We wrote the, the uh, you know, we had a, an alliance of environmentalists and economists, and we worked, struggled to create this concept of the Green New Deal. Again, it just fell like a lead balloon until Alexandria Ocasio Cortez picked it up. You know, if she hadn't picked it up, it wouldn't have gone anywhere um, because nobody was thinking about it. So, so I'm saying in desperation that I've come here to say to you, look, guys, this is happening out there. It's not rocket science. It's not beyond our comprehension. We've got to get a grip of it, and we've got to change that system, because the young people are telling us, in order to save the ecosystem, in order to save society from authoritarianism. You know. But I'm, I can see I haven't made much progress tonight. <laughs> <laughs> We're getting there. I will take uh, another batch, so another three. I think we'll go to this gentleman who I uh, ignored before. Anyone else? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Thank you. Um, uh, my, my background is um, practical. I am an agronomist, an economist, and I have worked in the, let's say, less developed countries in agriculture mostly, tropical agriculture and agriculture. Uh, but I am going to get out of that, just to give you the background. <coughs> I was involved in, uh, the sadly, by the side, by the reform of the medical system in Belgium, transforming it. And I've been exposed to a doctor who said very cleverly, never ask a doctor, even clever if you're a, a director of hospital, never ask him to reform the medical system or the system, the santé. Because 
is not going to be sufficiently free to get out of his trade to see what is wrong with it. I think with the bankers, no. It's the same. Even if they are nice, gentle, beautiful, and so forth, they are so trapped in their own system that they would, would first see the difficulties that would arise from proposal of reforms of change and stuff. I'm a bit afraid that, excuse me, friends, economists are a bit the same. They would try to, they know that there is something to change, but they think that it's, it's that part of the situation which is of their business, which is going to be. In. And what I terribly liked with your conference, uh, Professor, uh, is that you seem to be one of those persons who can see it's the business, it's the one business of none of them. It's the business of a complex situation of persons who are going to get a grid and would see that no, capitalism is never going, is never going to develop correctly the, the low country situation. And, and I think that's the sort of thinking we, we ought to pursue. And uh, as a conclusion, I, I was saying that with what you said about the history and the different mishappenings, um, which I studied as well, I mean, with Keynes, Swiss, and so on and so forth, uh, they have all failed. All those who have correctly thought, Keynes the first, he missed it, Wilson snapped it. Roosevelt tried, but it didn't change. And there are different mishaps, and in 2008 or 2009, uh, we, we, we missed also the boat mm. by the, the lack of proper reaction mm. to the situation. So. What I would like to see is, and that's the disappointment, I came also to hear how do, answer, how do you answer the question, so what? But I'm going to buy your book, and I think that I will find it sort of, because tonight it's maybe too late to go into that. Thank I you. Do, I don't know if it's available outside, but it's, I'm sure you can find it in all good bookstores. And uh, we have a, a, a lady up in the corner. If you could just pass it up. Thank you. Uh, and there's any one more? Yeah, sure. I'll take this off for a minute. Um, first of all, thank you, Anne, for the interesting speech. Um, I kind of wrote my question down. Um, it was really interesting to listen to everything, but I, my question remains, what could be the real catalyst to move away from this capitalist system? So what is going to push us to think of other solutions? Because we've gone through the pandemic and evidently that's not enough to push us to change. And I too am uh, of African background and you suggested that Europe leads the way to change, but in my opinion, it has caused some of the most damage in the past mm -hmm. to these African nations and others. And how does Europe even have any credibility to bring about change in this world? So I wonder, um, how are we going to do that? And you see that today as well, uh, I think, we're moving towards protectionism with the vaccines. We're not equally distributing them. So how can Europe really do that um, today? Thank you. And we'll have to bring it straight back down again for the last question. Uh, I was wondering uh, why you say that companies have been nationalized uh, by the states as a response to the crisis, because I understand they received a lot of money, but the state is not controlling them. So how do you define nationalization in this respect? I think a lot of the money, basically, if everything goes back to normal, will go back to the shareholders and the debt holders, and the state will just uh, mop the, de the kind of losses. So, I, I mean, you, you seem to be so happy about what happened and with Charles Michel. <laughs> No, absolutely right. Oh dear, you've caught me up on that one. I mean, I, sh I used that word nationalised too easily. I was trying to argue that, you know, the, these weren't functioning as a result of them. The market no longer worked. 
You know, the, the market was taken over by the state. So I was meaning it in that sense. But you're absolutely right, the state did so without applying any conditions. So it was unconditional. So they got all this largesse, which is why they've got $400 trillion out there, but with, with no terms. So, uh, so I'm, you're right to correct me on very loose use of that phrase. On the question of what's going to change, well, I, I really, you know, I mean, we could go into despair and say that nothing's going to change. We could say Europe is not the right power uh, there are three great powers in the world at the moment. Europe's not that one. Well, where then else? And I suppose what I, uh, I'm, I, I live by is that, you know, awareness. So I, I ran this campaign for the cancellation of the debts of the poorest countries. And it was, um, when we started, everybody said, oh, this is futile, really. <coughs> you can't explain to people how the international financial system works, creditors, debtors. And of course, when we went around, everybody said, why should we cancel their debts? You know, those black people, they're all corrupt, aren't they? They're incompetent. And I don't, you know, so we had this, this big fight on our hands. But we went around and we, we argued and we made the case. We explained how the system worked. We explained the difference between creditors and debtors and why the debtors had got into debt and the role the creditors played in all this. And... Um, we struggled, it was hard, but we had to write everything down one side of a page. But we just pushed out these, this, these facts, this, this analysis. And then the G8 summit came to Birmingham uh, to meet, to discuss, and we thought we'd get a demonstration going. And to our astonishment, 100,000 people came and um, put enormous pressure on world leaders, and $100 billion of debt was written off for about 30 of the poorest countries, ultimately. It, you know, that's small potatoes relative to the global economy. But what it taught me was that when people understand something, and, you know, when we started in the 80s and 90s, Thatcherism was still at its height. Um, and, you, you know, when, when, I, when I was asked, how can you explain to the people how the international financial system works and creditors and debtors? I said, well, it's not rocket science. It's not that difficult. But we, what is difficult is to communicate it in ways that are the correct, you know, that, that don't distort the facts. But you explain it. And we did explain it to people. And that, for me, the joy, the greatest joy of that campaign was and I met a, a senior civil servant at the Treasury. And he said to me, Anne, what the hell is going on here? He said, I get letters on pink pieces of paper with a bunch of roses in the corner. And the woman's writing to me about how we determined the cutoff date for determining Uganda's debt relief. Why we had discussed, why we'd agreed to this period to be the period under consideration for debt relief and not that period. Who talked to her about the cutoff date for Uganda's debt? And I said, we did. It's not rocket science. It's not difficult, right? And he said, oh, you know. He was shocked that there was that much awareness and understanding of ordinary women sitting at their kitchen table writing letters to the Treasury, you know. And I wasn't shocked. Because when people understand, so what, went, what happened was when, when the G8 summit came to Birmingham and 100,000 people turned up, we didn't really mobilize them because we didn't have a lot of money. We didn't have big resources. We weren't big institutions. But these people suddenly understood what was going on. And they were mad as hell when they understood. And once they understood, they, they campaigned really hard. So that's, I'm telling you this little story because this is what keeps me going, that a greater understanding of the way the system works and people understanding that, they will find ways of changing it. You know, we will find ways of changing it. But not if we, we allow it to stay a secret, not if we allow them to stay invisible. That's, that's all I'm saying. And thank you very much. Thank I you. think we've now actually run out of time. So um, my last task is to say thank you, everyone, for venturing out. I know it's very cold, and I know there's no more Uber in Brussels, and you know we might not be able to do this again for a while. Uh, but it's been wonderful to have such an engaged audience. Yeah. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Jens. And thank you, most of all, Anne, for being thank with you. us. Um, travel safely back to London, and hopefully um, these types of events will still be going on in a few months and uh, a few years' time. And like I said, I'm not sure if Anne's book is available outside, but... 
Um, I'm sure if you, um, if you Google, you'll find it in any good bookshop. So thank you very much, everyone.